Hey guys, in this video, Tim is going to be taking you through modelling memory as part of your A-level psychology. Now there are lots of important facts and things you need to get into your memory. So to help you do that, over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you. Of how memory works is called the multi-star model. This model tries to explain how the different types of memory work together and interact. That is sensory register, short-term memory or STM, and long-term memory or LTM. This model was proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin in 1968. This model accepts that memory is composed of three basic parts and the information has to move through all three in order to become a memory and be fixed in. As we can see, information from our environment is gained from our senses. This is sensory input, and it enters the sensory register, the first type of memory. Usually, we pay no direct attention to this information, and spontaneous decay occurs. It fades away very quickly. If we do pay attention to this sensory information, however, then it continues on, and it becomes part of our short-term memory, or STM. Short-term memory, as we've already seen, has a very finite duration and capacity. It can only hold a small amount of information for a small amount of time. So for the information to become a long-term memory, we need to rehearse and repeat it. Rehearsing and repeating information will either retain it in the short-term memory, it will keep it looping around in short-term memory, or it will place it into long-term memory, where at least theoretically, it can remain forever. If this information is not rehearsed or recalled for a long period of time, then it'll be forgotten. It leaves both short-term memory and long-term memory and leaves our memory entirely. There is evidence for this multi-star model, and a range of studies have been done that have provided scientific evidence in support of this model. The first of these is the primacy effect. Research has shown that the first few items on a list are recalled with greater accuracy than those in the middle of the list. This is because they have been rehearsed more they're more firmly placed into long-term memory. If rehearsal is interrupted by an interference task, something else that you do that stops you committing it to memory, then this effect stops. We can see it here with this list of numbers. One, nine, six, five, four, two, nine, five, seven. When presenting with this list, we find it easier to recall the first three numbers, one, nine, six, than we do the three in the middle, five, four, two. That is the primacy effect. A second piece of evidence for the multi-store model is the recency effect. Research has also shown that participants recall the last few items in a list better than those in the middle. Short-term memory has a capacity of roughly seven items, so if the items in the middle of the list are not rehearsed, then they're replaced by newer or more recent items. If we again take our list of numbers, one, nine, six, five, four, two, nine, five, seven, the three at the end of the list, 9, 5, and 7, are more easily recalled than those in the middle, 5, 4, and 2. Aside from experimental evidence for the multistore model, there is also strong medical evidence. One of these pieces of evidence is Korsakoff syndrome. This is a rare neurological condition that causes amnesia. Usually, the cause of Korsakoff syndrome is chronic and extreme dependency on alcohol. People with this condition tend to support the multistore model. Usually, they are able to recall the last few items in a list. This is the recency effect that we've already seen, but they struggle to remember those in the middle. From this, it can be concluded that their short-term memory is working normally. However, people with Korsakoff syndrome find it extremely difficult and almost impossible to form or recall long-term memories. They have a malfunctioning long-term memory, or LTM. This supports the idea, as it is in the multistore model, that LTM, long-term memory, and STM, short-term memory, are both separate and different. Another piece of medical evidence for the multistore model is this. In 1957, a group of researchers led by Milner carried out a case study on one single individual. This patient, who was nicknamed HM, has suffered chronic and severe epilepsy over a long period of time. His seizures were caused by a very specific part of his brain near the hippocampus, which was surgically removed by surgeons. HM was then able to form short-term memories completely normally, but was also completely unable to form any new long-term memories. As before, this suggested that long-term memory, LTM, and short-term memory, STM, were two completely separate and different parts of the brain. As with any model or explanation in psychology, there are problems. 
Brain activity and patterns of the brain are especially difficult for medicine and psychology to research. So the multistore model is not a complete and universal system and explanation. There are issues with the theory. The first of these is that the model assumes that information moves from short-term memory STM to long-term memory LTM through rehearsal. People do not make a deliberate decision to repeat information to themselves over and over again. Yet this information that we receive every day does still sometimes enter our long-term memory. Some information also can't be precisely rehearsed. You can't rehearse smelling a certain smell. You can't rehearse the sensation of a certain touch. A second problem with the multi-store model is that it's quite simplistic. It assumes that there is a single unified long-term memory and a single unified short-term memory. Studies that have been done on patients with amnesia or brain damage have suggested that in fact there are multiple stores of short-term memories and multiple stores of long-term memories. As we've already seen, there are issues with the multi-store model. And in an effort to improve it, Badley and Hitch in 1974 developed the working memory model. This is a model specific to short-term memory and only covers that part of it. It seeks to describe and explain how our short-term memory operates and works. This model describes short-term memory as a processor-based system rather than a single, simple store. Think of it as a factory more than a barn. Key to this model is the central executive, which you can see on the diagram here. Another way of thinking about the central executive is that it's our attention. This central executive has a limited amount of capacity and it controls several lesser or slave systems that each also have limited amounts of capacity. They are the phonological loop, the episodic buffer, the visuospatial sketchpad, and our long-term memory. So as we can see, there are several slave systems working under this central executive. And remember that another word for central executive is just our attention. The phonological loop, which is seen here on the left, holds speech-based information, auditory information. It contains a phonological store, the inner ear, which hears our inner voice, and an articulatory process, our inner voice, which repeats information to rehearse it again and again and again. The visuospatial sketch pad, which is seen here on the right, stores information relating to spaces and images. And lastly, the episodic buffer, which was actually only added to this model in around 2000, stores some information and combines it with the information in the long-term memory to put together complete scenes and scenarios, which are called episodes. As with the multi-star model, there is some experimental evidence for the working memory model. Badley and Hitch based their model on evidence from a range of experiments. Usually, these experiments involved interference tasks. These are tasks designed to interrupt the short-term memory and stop it efficiently storing information. They found that if a participant was to try and do two tasks which use the same system at the same time, they performed badly. An example of this would be saying right, left, right, left at the same time as reading a passage from a book. Both of these tasks use the phonological loop. They're both auditory tasks involving words. This phonological loop has a limited capacity. It can't process the information for both tasks at the same time. That's beyond its ability and capacity, and therefore we fail at trying to do both tasks together. However, if the participant was to try and do two tasks at the same time which use different systems, this didn't present a problem. An example would be saying right, left, right, left again, while walking a set path around a room. Those two tasks use two completely different systems. Therefore, limited capacity isn't an issue and we can do both effectively. Charlize and Warrington, working in 1974, found further medical evidence for the working memory model. This single case study on a single patient involved a patient nicknamed KF. This patient had suffered brain damage, which led to an impaired short-term memory. This patient had issues recalling information that had been presented to them verbally but not with information that had been presented visually through graphs or charts, for example. This suggested that some parts of KF's memory, specifically the short-term memory, were functional. The visuospatial cortex in particular appeared to be functioning perfectly with no issues. But other parts of KF's short-term memory seemed to be malfunctioning. An ability to recall information that had been presented verbally suggests that the articulatory loop wasn't working properly or at all. This does provide some evidence for STM consisting of several separate but interconnected systems. One had stopped working, the articulatory loop in this case, but the rest were functional. A further piece of evidence for the working memory model came from Gavacol and Badley in 1993. This was a laboratory study using the independent group's design, so there was good control over the variables and it was repeatable and scalable. Participants were placed into two groups, and both groups were asked to follow a moving spot of light. 
Each group was also given a second task to do at the same time. One group was asked to measure angles, and the other group did a basic verbal task involving repeating some words. Therefore, group one was doing two tasks, which, but which both used the visuospatial sketchpad. Group two was doing one task using this visuospatial sketchpad, and one using the articulatory loop. Group one performed far worse at the task of following the light than group two. This would suggest that the two tasks use different systems, providing further evidence for the working memory model. The working memory model is much more complex than the multistore model. It takes into account some of the inconsistencies and problems with the multistore model and advances on it. For example, one problem with the multistore model is that it does not explain why some have long-term memory without rehearsal. The working memory model goes at least some way towards explaining this. However, there are three main issues with the working memory model. A lot of people think that the idea of the central executive is very vague and simplistic. Merely labelling it as our attention doesn't really explain what it actually is or how it works. A second issue is that this model only explains short-term memory. It mentions long-term memory, but it makes no effort to explain fully how information moves from our short-term to long-term memories. It's a very limited model. Thirdly, the research that has been done to back up this working memory model has almost always been done in a laboratory. This model may therefore have very limited ecological validity. It might not apply in the real world.